My name's uh, Dan McGilvery. I'm Managing Director for Academic Relations and uh, Sector Lead for Energy and the Environment at OCE. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before we go too far, I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, support of Gowlings, who is the sponsor for this theater. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to discuss smart grid security and privacy. And the comment that I have in before me is that as we develop and digitize the electrical grid, the twin sleeper issue is security and privacy, which will become critical as we move forward. And our job now is to try to ensure that integrity and reliability of the grid is, is maintained as we develop the grid and respect the consumer's privacy. To guide us through our discussion today, our moderator is Paul Murphy. Paul is President and CEO of the IESO, the Independent Electricity Systems Operator, and Paul is also Chair of the Smart Grid Forum. So without further comment, Paul, I turn it over to you, sir. Thanks very much, Dan. As Dan mentioned, I have the, uh, I have the privilege of chairing Ontario's Smart Grid Forum. And uh, I can assure you that uh, in the report, the second report that our forum has just put out this week, privacy and security is clearly recognized as being absolutely central to the success of implementation of a, of a modern electricity grid. And uh, today, you are, you're really, really fortunate today because we've, we've got an absolutely stellar panel. And I'm going to give you some very brief introductions uh, for them in order to be able to get right uh, to their comments. Um, but we've only got an hour or so, and that's the only thing that's disappointed me about this panel is that we only are going to have an hour because I'm sure you're going to want to, want to hear a lot about them. So as I'm introducing them, I'll start on my, my far left with uh, Dr. Ann Kavukian. And Dr. Kavukian is the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. Uh, most of you will probably know Dr. Kavukian well if you know anything about this sector because she is recognized as one of the leading privacy experts in the world, not just in Ontario, but in the world. And I joked with her earlier that she's got uh, far too many distinctions for me to be able to mention them all today, and I know you want to spend your time listening to her, and so do I. But one of her most recent ones that's uh, particularly relevant to this panel was to be named one of the top 11 movers and shakers for the global smart grid industry for 2011, and that was by Intelligent Utility Magazine. And recognizing that, um, that privacy issues don't really have any borders, Dr. Gavukian has been influenced, uh, has, has been influencing privacy protection uh, around the world uh, with her own concept of privacy by design, which I know I expect that she'll, she'll speak to you about. But uh, Anne's dedication to privacy issues has been tireless uh, she, on behalf of Ontario. Um, she's worked with the Smart Grid Forum and we're extremely grateful to the, uh, to the assistance and guidance that you've been, been able to provide to the, to the forum. So welcome Anne. Next to, to Anne is uh, John Norman. John is the Director of Transmission and Distribution Policy with the Ontario Ministry of Energy. John is a professional engineer with 10 years, over 10 years of experience in consulting and in government. His career spans both the energy and environmental sectors as well as management consulting. Currently, he's responsible for policy development related to electricity grid expansion, smart networks, and Ontario's feed-in tariff program. Uh, John has been a tremendous contributor as a member of the Ontario Smart Grid Forum, um, trying to uh, translate the work of the forum, uh, sometimes it's a little bit cryptic in our language, into actionable, actionable uh, policy direction by the government. And we're certainly thankful to be able to have that contribution uh, to our work. Next to John is uh, Doug Westlin, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of, sorry, did we switch? <laughs> I switched. Next to John is uh, Daniel Thanos. Daniel is a Chief Cyber Security Architect at GE Digital Energy where he heads the global cyber security R&D standards and product development initiatives for critical infrastructure industries and the smart grid. He specializes in designing and developing security software and hardware technologies for mission critical environments. He's written multiple patents in the security and cryptology field and his current areas of research involve intelligent security systems and machine learning real-time and embedded security and security convergence. And I hope that you'll talk to us about some of those today. Actually, Daniel said he's, he's most comfortable working away in the seclusion of his basement, but we're certainly glad that he was uh, able to come out and join us today. Last, finally, to, uh, to my immediate left here is, is Doug Westlin. Doug is the Chief Executive Officer and the co-founder of End Dimension Solutions. Prior to End Dimension, Doug was a Vice President at AT&T Canada with responsible responsibility for the data, internet, hosting, and security product lines. 
Having studied as an engineer and with an MBA, Doug has led the growth of N-Dimension to become a leading cybersecurity solutions provider for utilities. Doug's a regular speaker on cybersecurity in the energy sector at industry conferences like this and across North America, and he's active in assisting utilities in North America with their smart grid planning and deployment, and Doug has also assisted us in the smart grid form, and again, we're very appreciative of the assistance and guidance that he's been able to provide us, so thank you for joining us today as well, Doug. So without further ado, I'd like to jump right into this panel. I've, uh, we have four wonderful speakers. We've only got one hour to be able to uh, squeeze all the remarks into, so I've asked them to try and keep their remarks abbreviated so that they all get a chance, and hopefully we'll get a chance for a few questions and answers from the audience uh, afterwards. Thanks very much, and uh, Dr. Kavukian, if you could get us started off. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to try to go quickly, uh, and at the end, hopefully, we'll have some time for question and answers. I'm going to talk to you about privacy by design and how it applies to the smart grid. And so in order to do that, first I'm going to give you a, a two-minute what is privacy by design so you have the context in which I'm going to apply it to smart meters and the smart grid. Traditionally, the way to protect privacy over the years has been through various laws, privacy regulation, various policies, etc. The problem with that is, and, and believe me, I'm not suggesting we do away with those. I'm a regulator, so I assure you, I want you to comply with the privacy laws of the land. But privacy laws tend to be reactive after the fact. They offer systems of redress after the harm has arisen. And the reality is, in this world of growing interconnectedness, Wi-Fi, everything morphing into the cloud, we're not going to be able to identify the majority of the harms and privacy breaches that arise, let alone have the opportunity to investigate and then offer systems of redress afterwards. It's not enough. It's too little, too late. And what I was envisioning when I came up with the idea of privacy by design is a proactive, not a reactive system of protecting privacy. Proactively embedding privacy into the design of new technologies, of existing business practices, networked infrastructure, embedding privacy as the default in an emerging system, ideally, such that it's baked into your design, into your architecture as a core functionality. That way you don't have to think about it. You don't have to think about retrofitting solutions after the fact. You have privacy baked into all that you do in terms of your design. And that way you can prevent the harm from arising in the first place, and so you don't have to worry about offering systems of redress. It is not only far more efficient, it's much less costly than the way we've been doing things. So the essence of privacy by design, seven foundational principles, I'm going to race through them, and I've already touched on many of them. They're proactive, they prevent the harm, privacy is embedded as the default. When something is the default setting, you don't have to ask for it, it's there automatically in your system. It is immersed throughout the technology or the business practice, whatever it is you're doing. Full functionality is absolutely essential. By that I mean, traditionally, thus far, the approach often taken towards privacy is a zero-sum approach, by which I mean it's privacy or some other functionality. Privacy or security, privacy or marketing, business interests. Invariably, privacy is the one that is rejected in favor of the other interests. I reject that model, and I want you to view it as the dated old world model. Substitute a positive sum model. By positive sum, yeah, you mean, I mean two functionalities that coexist in a doubly enabling manner, privacy and smart meters, privacy and security. You replace the versus, you get rid of that, you replace it with an and, such that you have both interests represented in a positive sum, doubly enhancing manner, and it enhances the entire level of protection offered by that system. End-to-end -end security is a given. You cannot have privacy without strong security. You can have strong security without privacy. The reverse is true. So what I want you to think of in terms of privacy is privacy and security offered interchangeably together. Visibility and transparency is essential. You got to keep it open, accountable, and ideally focused on the user, keeping it user-centric. 
Now, I got involved in working in the smart grid a couple of years ago uh, when a reporter called me and wanted my views on privacy and the emerging smart grid. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't have many views at the time. This is going back two, three years. And I asked the person, I said, look, can I call you tomorrow? I'm going to just study what I can. My level of knowledge is limited at this point and I'll tell you my thoughts on it tomorrow. He said, fine. I called him the next day, and I said, here's my biggest takeaway from this. I don't know where the privacy issue is being addressed. When I reviewed as much as I could that evening and the next morning, what struck me was that privacy was the sleeper issue in the area. And I just want to challenge only one point um, that, that Paul made earlier. I don't think it's a double sleeper issues. I don't think security is a sleeper issue because when they do address something other than energy related issues, they talk about the need for cyber security, which is very, very strong. It's an essential need, absolutely. I hear very few people talking equally about the need for privacy. So I think privacy is the sleeper issue, was the sleeper issue. It's gained a lot of recognition in the past year and I'm delighted that we have had just such success here in our own jurisdiction with Hydro One and Toronto Hydro. They have been fabulous. Just in case you're wondering, why the heck does she care? Why do we have to worry about privacy on the smart grid? What's the big deal? The big deal is this. Once you have smart meters on homes, and you know that in Ontario, smart meters are mandated by law. In, I think, two years' time, everyone in the province will have smart meters. In Toronto, we already have them. They've been put in place. So you now have two-way communication and in near real time, 15-minute intervals. And as homes increasingly have their appliances upgraded and replaced with smart appliances, then your actual electrical usage within the household, remember, the house is your castle. This is where privacy is sacrosanct behind the walls of your home. But someone will now be able to peer inside your home through your electrical usage patterns. Academics have referred to this as the creation of an entirely new library of personal information that can reveal when you awaken, when you shower, when you eat, when you leave the house, presumably for work, when you charge your electric car, when many people have electric cars, when you watch TV how late into the night and you keep waking up late and showing up late at the office. There are so many patterns of behavior that will be detectable through this. I was recently at um, Distributech as a big conference in San Diego a couple of months ago, and I was talking to one of the executives from one of the large utilities in California, and I, I spent like an hour over dinner one night trying to convince him of the merits of privacy by design, and he said, okay, 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 you got me. He said, now, tell me, what's it going to cost me? And I said, sir, you're asking the wrong question. You should be saying, what's it going to save me? Because this is going to save you so much money. I can guarantee if you don't embed privacy into the design of the smart meters and smart grid, you will have data breaches, and that will damage not only your pocketbook, because there will be class action lawsuits. Look at Sony now there will also be damage to your reputation, to your brand. So we have had the pleasure of partnering with Hydro One and uh, Toronto Hydro, and we've done two papers with them. This is the, the paper we did with Toronto Hydro and Hydro One, and we more recently did a paper with Hydro One, GE, IBM, and Telvin, where we operationalized privacy by design, those seven foundational principles, into how would this actually work in the guts of the smart meter and the smart grid? How do you actually make this play out? Take a look at our paper. You'll see how it plays out. It's real. And we've just uh, just closed a deal with, and I can just tell you because we were in an, an, under an NDA last week, with San Diego Gas and Electric. We're going to be working with them our, as our U.S. partner to embed privacy by design into their dynamic pricing system that they are just developing. California Public Utility Commission has just issued 143 pages of rules that they want smart uh, the utilities to follow in terms of smart meters and smart grid development in California. All around the world, this is growing significantly, and privacy is increasingly becoming a focus. We've also partnered with, um, in Berlin, Germany, we're doing a pilot project with them on how privacy by design will be embedded into their, their utilities. So we now have a partnership with Canada, of course, with the U.S. and um, an EU utility. The reason we do this, we go so, so wide, we don't just stay in Ontario, is in my view, 
privacy knows no bounds. Technology transcends jurisdiction. If you think you're just going to protect privacy within the walls of Ontario, you're sadly mistaken. Increasingly, there will be no jurisdiction. There will be so much that morphs into the cloud. There is considerable outsourcing. There is so much taking place. To me, the future is protecting privacy by design, embedding it into the design of what we do. Back to the smart grid. I want you to know that you shouldn't be concerned, if you are, about the en enormous toll that protecting privacy on the smart grid or the smart meters will, will take. Because what we did on our last paper with Hydro One, GE, and IBM, we divided what does it mean to protect privacy and the smart grid, for example, into three domains. There's a customer domain, a services domain, and the grid domain. The grid domain actually, and this isn't to scale, is the largest representation on the smart grid. The actual amount of personally identifiable information that you need to worry about protecting in the entire grid is very limited. It's, it's less than maybe 10, 20 percent of the entire formulation of the smart grid. The grid domain is, exceeds 70 percent of the entire formulation. So I give you that example just to show that while, yes, you do have a duty of care, you have to protect personally identifiable information that is linked to electrical information and electrical usage patterns that reside with our utilities, you don't have to be concerned that that is an overwhelming task, and we will work with you, as we did with Hydro One, as we did with Toronto Hydro, to show you how to do it. So it is something you have to do, you should do, it's something that is not difficult to do, and we will walk you through the how, how do you do it. Um, we're working with partners, our utilities, GE has been fabulous. We have an ongoing partnership with them, as we do with IBM, and utilities around the world increasingly. So I just don't want you to be concerned that this is going to be some unbelievably onerous requirement. The other thing you should know is that right here in Ontario, the minister of energy, Minister um, Brad Duguid, he released in November of last year a directive to the Ontario Energy Board and in it, it basically says that the board shall take the following steps in relation to the establishment and promotion of a smart grid and he outlines a number of things. In item number four, uh, privacy, respect and, pr and protect the privacy of customers. This is not only in this directive, it's in our privacy laws in this jurisdiction. So I'm going to wrap it up here simply because we are very short on time, but I want you to know that this is eminently doable and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have afterwards. Thank you very much. Good for you, you did. Oh, sorry, I should, yeah. I should have asked each of the uh, speakers if, in, in order to save time and me get, having to get up and down, if they could just introduce the next speaker. I don't want to go against great. protocol. Um, well, it's actually it's a pleasure to follow uh, Dr. Kavukian's present, presentation because it, it's a it's a good segue into well, what is it that we are doing on Smart Grid now? And she alluded to uh, some of the the minister's um, directive and some of the principles that he's put out. Uh, and what I'd like to do is just give a very quick overview of why we're moving on smart grid, why it's actually important that we collect this information, and then what we're going to be doing in terms of process and actual implementation to try and address the privacy and security concerns. I like, uh, because of an oversight, I like Dr. Kavukian's definition of privacy <laughs> being uh, in security can exist without privacy, but privacy cannot exist without security. So really what this is, privacy and security in Ontario smart grid. So I've spoken a lot about smart grid over the past um, few years and Ontario is really on the cusp of a new sort of distribution infrastructure, one that's going to take advantage of a lot more IT and communications technology that's available right now, some of which is emerging but some of which is available. And that's important because like many other industries that have moved towards collecting more and more information to be able to do things better, the grid can actually run more efficiently, more reliably, more cleanly, including integrating renewable generation and so on, by taking advantage of sort of a communications layer on top of the grid. So in other words, right now, grid operators run the electricity system by and large and don't have a lot of visibility on that system. A smart grid is about getting visibility on that system, collecting information, allowing for two-way communication flows, 
And as Dr. Kivukin points out, that involves the customer's house as well, potentially, if there's particular objectives that can be achieved, like conservation, for instance, or greater customer control. So what's driving that? Well, there's really three big things that we kind of like to point out. I mean, one is just that the infrastructure itself is aging, so it needs to be replaced. And we're kind of entering a cycle of asset replacement. We're not going to sort of use equipment from 50 years ago. We're going to use latest equipment that allows us to achieve these objectives better. It also will allow us to maximize existing hard wires, poles, and so on much better. Uh, simply because we'll know exactly how much power is getting used in a particular point or how much uh, tolerance there might be in terms of voltage or so on on the system. It also lets us lay a foundation towards a smarter home. And a smarter home means home energy management systems. It means automatic control of appliances. It means two-way communication flows back with the grid operator that allows the house to become part of the grid rather than just a blind load. And that's important from the grid's perspective because that means that customers can become more responsive to when the grid conditions require it. But it also means that a lot of information is required to be passed back and forth to do it. So what we are trying to do and th this slide is actually very similar to a concept that, that Dr. Kavukian pointed out, which is there's really different types of data on the smart grid. So, for example, as you're moving towards uh, integrating more and more renewable energy, you'll need more and more information about the power flows on particular feeders. There's a lot of data and information and devices that will get put on the distribution network to do it. Does that necessarily have a privacy concern implicitly? No, not necessarily. It may have a security concern, however. Data behind the meter implicitly involving customers' consumption, which from which their habits can be inferred, uh, their lifestyle and so on, is very, very critical in terms of, first of all, the customer consenting to that data being used, and also the privacy and security of that data, as you can imagine. So as we move forward on Smart Grid, what we're trying to do is lay a foundation. The Privacy Commissioner is doing a lot of work with some leading utilities like Hydro One and Toronto Hydro, and actually working on operationalizing these sort of privacy by design principles. We want to make sure that that actually applies across the electricity sector. So those, it's almost like operationalization on the ground at those types of utilities while laying a foundation, for instance, in the minister's smart grid directive to the regulator of the electricity system saying, you shall respect and protect the privacy of customers. And not only integrating privacy requirements into smart grid planning at the outset, so not being reactive about it, but also potentially including privacy impact assessments in a proactive sense when actually preparing grid expansion or uh, smart grid plans. Same goes with security, ensuring the security elements are in place that allows data to be secure. And of course, the, the, our two next speakers can provide a lot more information about the types of things that the industry needs to do in a technical sense to allow that to happen. Finally, I would point out just uh, a, a reference that Paul made, the Smart Grid Forum, which is a collection of CEOs and leaders within the electricity sector in Ontario has put out a report on their second report on moving the smart grid forward. Um, one of the key or two, two, one of the key recommendations or one of the seven key recommendations was ensuring that privacy and security are actually moved forward on not only by grid operators and distribution companies, but also by third-party service providers that might say, for instance, be providing home energy, home energy uh, management services to end-use customers. And so having the infrastructure in place that allows that to happen. So right now we're going through processes with Ontario's regulator uh, to actually develop guidelines that will guide the sector in implementing a smart grid of which privacy and security will be a big element. Thank you very much. John?
right. I'm going to try to make my presentation uh, uh, fast um, because I'm sure everyone's getting very tired of the slideware by now and we probably want to get into a uh, conversation. Um, this is normally a presentation that takes me a little longer to do so I'll be, be going uh, breadth first instead of depth first for those that know uh, algorithms. So um, sorry. I'm going to talk to the uh, topic of um, smart grid security convergence. This is an idea that I've been talking to, um, talking about in various forums. Um, it's basically the idea of uh, bringing the various technical elements that make up the smart grid and kind of un unifying the security around them. And we'll talk to why that's important. We're going to talk a little bit about the current state of smart grid security and um, emerging threats that are actually happening in, in adjacent uh, spaces and um, security evolution. What are the things that we need to begin to work on as an industry uh, across uh, many sectors, uh, both private and uh, public? But briefly, a word from my uh, company, uh, from our sponsor here, GE. GE makes uh, a lot of the devices, as you can imagine, that make up the smart grid. I uh, mean, in our, in our division, Digital Energy, which is essentially the smart grid business uh, for GE, uh, we do all of the controllers, uh, all of the communication systems, uh, the wireless devices, the smart meters, everything that goes into, into the smart grid. And as you can imagine, I spend uh, a lot of time worrying about the security of these things and, and trying to constantly uh, evolve it, both in new systems and a lot of legacy systems. Uh, the reality is that the smart grid is not being built on top of totally new infrastructure. It's being overlaid on legacy infrastructure and that, prevent, that, that presents some unique challenges that uh, we have to continue to work at. So what is smart grid security convergence? Security convergence is the idea of looking at the three distinct technical domains that make up the smart grid. Smart grid is made up of huge elements of IT as we've been discussing, uh, communication systems that essentially connect everything together and the industrial control systems and power systems which is kind of like the infrastructure that makes power delivery and control possible. And all of these domains have unique security considerations to be addressed. However, what's been happening in industry traditionally is that we're kind of addressing these things in their individual silos. What we need to do though is holistically address these things. We need to build converged security infrastructure that actually collects all of the security information, unifies all of the processes into a, a unified security process, uh, into a unified uh, security operation center, if you will, and develop security infrastructure and tools around that. And there are some unique challenges to be addressed um, in Smart Grid because it has an unprecedented level of scale and distribution. It has a lot of legacy issues in terms of things that exist. It has lifetime issues. When you put equipment out into the power grid, on average, it has to last between, you know, it could be as minimum as 10 years, it could, has to, it could go up to 20 years because we have to keep power affordable. That means, you know, we can't be cycling out devices in the smart grid like we do when we want to buy our 42-inch TV or when we want to cycle out a, a computer. So we have some unique things to engineer for that have uh, very long longevity requirements. And then, of course, the smart grid is, is designed to be very real-time, very autonomous. You, you're going to have a lot of devices um, out there that are going to be making decisions on their own and actually communicating on a machine-to-machine -machine basis. They're not necessarily under a centralized authority or under a centralized monitoring. So th again, there's some unique um, security challenges there that need to be continued to be addressed and evolved. And then, of course, what I'm trying to communicate in the slide, which is most important, is that the sum of all of these parts it, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of all of these parts. All right, so it's not in securing these things um, individually. In fact, if you do that, you will degrade reliability in the, in the smart grid. I can tell you of instances where if you start to introduce certain security protocols without due consideration, you will create d trivial denial of service conditions in the smart grid. So where are we at today? Um, as I've discussed, we, you know, there are some baseline security technologies and tools being deployed. Systems are being kind of secured in, in their silos. There's basic processes there. The industry has become very acutely aware. Um, you know, we're tracking a lot of things that are happening. Uh, utilities, vendors. Um, 
specifically in the area of what I call targeted advanced um, uh, malware or, or, or threats. Um, for the first time, there's a little thing called Stuxnet in the industry. This is where, for the very first time, we've seen very sophisticated classes of malware that could penetrate into control systems, infect them, and cause physical impact and damage. In fact, uh, from what we know from current intelligence, they caused severe damage to the Iranian nuclear program. And that's going to have to perhaps exhibit a response. And so this is a very real space. It, uh, things were theoretical before, but now they're becoming very real. The industry, of course, has formed a lot of groups. A lot of these groups I play in under NIST, uh, OpenSGI, Triple E, IEC, ANSI. Everyone is trying to address this issue within the scope of you know, their standards and their systems. And uh, uh, organizations are investing heavily in R&D in this area. They're dedicating people's time like mine to continue to do research in this area and participate in all of these groups to come to the next generation practices and technologies that are going to be necessary to continually counter the, the threat. And then the last point is very important um, that I'd like to make, and that is that the reality is that the largest uh, risk that we're facing is not driven by technology, it's actually driven by a lack um, of trained people in this area, cross-trained people in this area. Um, we need to have um, more people that actually understand all of those technical domains and how they kind of fit together and have the cybersecurity expertise. Uh, because it's very easy to go to a utility and tell them to do all types of different things or go to a vendor and ask them to do these things. But without um, a, a strong training in the workforce, people will not be, will not be able to operationalize any, any of this technology. They won't know how to manage it. All right, so in the security world, we used to think that if I have a perimeter, kind of like in the physical world, if I have a fence, around my systems. If I have an electronic fence around my systems, a firewall, for example, I am secure. That is sadly not the case. I don't think it ever was the case. Um, most sophisticated threats happen behind your perimeter. Um, people uh, either maliciously do things or they are used in unanticipated ways to be part of an attack. If you look at the Stuxnet example that I just discussed briefly, uh, USB thumb drives were used in the attack. Um, you know, these, these devices here have become ubiquitous. Uh, you use these things every day. They make a very convenient uh, threat vector. They make a very convenient way to, to get all types of nasty things into your network because you, the employee already has the trusted access that they need. They will get in. They may plug something in. They're not malicious, but maybe someone put something on here and now it's spreading. And that's what actually happened. That was the threat uh, entry vector for a Stuxnet. Um, and of course, the other challenge that we're facing is because more and more IT-oriented technologies are coming into our critical infrastructures, this is not just in the area of smart grid, it's in the area of all types of critical infrastructures, um, be it you know, water, gas, everything. It's more and more IT technologies are getting closer and closer to these critical systems. That also means that their associated threats are getting closer and closer to these systems. And that's going to be something that we have to uh, address and evolve some solutions around. So I talked a little bit about to, uh, the idea of Stuxnet and the fact that it's just basically targeted advanced malware. So this is like the classic you know, virus threats we used to hear of, uh, you know, code, the code red worm and things of this nature, but not widespread. Um, these things are very targeted. It's not they're going to spread over the internet. They're going to be you know, delivered using very sophisticated means. And, um, but they're going to use a lot of the underlying malicious technologies that classical malware has used to propagate and execute their mission. Uh, I have some recommended reading at the end, but if you understand uh, what something like Stuxnet did, uh, you can begin to understand where, you know, where the threat space is going and, and how these uh, offensive uh, security technologies, how they're evolving. This is a very important point. Um, and it's something the U.S. is kind of facing to a lesser degree. We're not facing this as much. Uh, but a lot of people think that you know, the sole way to bring security uh, into critical infrastructure is just through compliance, new regulations. That's it. That, that solves the problem. It may be that you know, certain types of smart regulations are needed, but 
Um, if you just blindly write regulations, they can actually degrade your security and they can actually degrade your reliability. Um, that's because security threats are constantly evolving. And the only way you can counter them is to have continual innovation. Compliance and regulation only represents a point in time understanding of current technologies and current threats. Our adversaries don't work that way. They innovate. They don't care if you have compliance and legislation and all of these things. They're just going to do what it takes to get into your systems. And so therefore, whatever we do in this area, we have to address that. We have to actually address how do you make security a continuous domain of innovation in order to continually counter uh, what's happening in the, in the threat space. And finally, just getting to cybersecurity evolution. This is kind of like my, my big picture slide here. There are things that you have to do in, in your organization, in your business, in the technical and R&D space, and in policy. You have to do all of these things in concert. Okay? Security is not just a technical problem. It's, a, it's an issue of, of how you actually, you know, what, what is your, how does your organization actually, how does it accomplish security governance? Uh, one thing that I have found that's disturbing in many organizations in the critical infrastructure space, not just in smart grids, um, is the fact that security people are actually very low in the totem pole. They're very buried. Um, executives do not have a lot of awareness uh, around what the issues are, and they don't have a direct line to a security person at an executive level. So they can't possibly be making the type of decisions they need to make. That's why you get you know, policies that maybe are one page in the, in the area and don't say much. So where you place your security organization in the hierarchy actually dictates the quality of security you're going to get and how serious you're taking the issue. And that's something that has to evolve in the industry. Um, we need to have uh, more risk and cost driven models. In other words, you, there's no way that you can perfectly secure anything. But you should be making sure that you're securing your most pertinent risks under smart investment. Um, people have blown, I've seen in industry people blow a lot of money in buying all types of software and hardware. And really, at the end of the day, it's probably not protecting their most critical threats because they haven't gone through the process of actually understanding what their risks are. And they're not optimizing their investments in the area. And, they're not, and sometimes they're not, they're not taking the long-term view. It's, very, again, very easy to deploy boxes and software. How do you operate them? How do you evolve them? How do you continually measure yourself so you know that you're matching the latest threats? We're, we're not there yet. We're not doing that. Uh, within the vendor space, we, you have to get involved. And you've got to start doing more secure development and testing programs. Certainly starting that in, our, in GE, we've been very heavily focused in that area. Uh, much more industry coordination and information sharing uh, between government entities and ourselves actually being aware of threats as they happen, getting actionable information to do these things. The U.S. government actually has become very active in this area and the current administration is proposing a lot of things uh, in this regard. Um, of course, that's another issue for us as Canadians. We have to figure out what that kind of means for us and, and our sovereignty, our privacy issues um, that will emerge out of this. Um, but it's going to be an interesting domain. There's a lot of challenges ahead. And of course, you got to do a lot of technical R&D. Uh, that's kind of my plug. I do a lot of that. And you, know, you just have to get into solving a lot of the hard technical problems. And the good, good news is there's going to be a huge market for these things. Uh, for us to become leaders in cyber technologies here in Canada will offer a tremendous advantage to us, uh, especially our youth, uh, as it becomes a very innovative field to get involved in. And of course, uh, policy is going to be very important. Um, and we know Anne is already very, very uh, active uh, on the behalf of Canadians uh, and now even globally in that regard. So I'm glad we're kind of taking that lead in the privacy area. I really want us to see us start to do that more also in the security area because as Anne said, you need to have, you kind of have to have security infrastructure, security technologies and tools to actually enforce and do the things that you need to do for privacy. And finally, some uh, recommended reading and homework uh, for people. Um, there's a lot of groups in this area. Um, I'm, I'm very heavily involved with NIST groups, uh, Department of Homeland Security groups in the U.S. And uh, there's a lot of activity and I just kind of encourage everyone to, uh, 
um, you know, look at what, what all of these groups are doing. Um, I lead uh, a group under NIST, under the NIST Cybersecurity Working Group for, called Design Principles. And it's actually about, uh, you know, kind of defining, uh, you know, what are the future designs that are needed to begin to address a lot of these threats and kind of uh, also address a lot of the legacy challenges and whatnot. Uh, right now I'm kind of working on uh, cryptography and key management issues for them. And, uh, and that's all. And then there's also some reading on Stuxnet there and uh, some very important industry specific things that happened. Uh, I recommend that everyone if that's interested in this space uh, uh, read uh, uh, NIST, NIST IR 7628. Uh, um, it has defined a lot uh, around what smart grid security is. I've spent a lot of my blood, sweat, and tears and sleepless nights help, helping them write it. So um, I'm a little biased, but it, it is a good document nonetheless. All right, that's all. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, I firmly believe that privacy and security are, in fact, the most pressing issues as it relates to uh, effective deployment of smart grid. Um, myself, my company, we've been talking about this for many, many years, in fact, before most were aware of the problem, and we currently sit, in fact, on many of the committees that Daniel does as well. So I'd like to share with you today uh, what are the real risks, and more importantly, what do you do about them for effective smart grid deployments? Uh, Paul Murphy, uh, we talked about with the Ontario Smart Grid Forum, uh, very, very good leadership in terms of developing what I believe is the best framework for smart grid of anything I've seen. We do a lot of work in the United States and I haven't seen anything like it, Paul, so hats off to you and, and all the, the best thinkers that came together. Um, in the first report, uh, cybersecurity was raised as a, as a very pressing issue, an uh, intertwined issue, uh, a foundational issue, if you like. And uh, some of the risks that were identified uh, are shown in the slide. Uh, first off, the proliferation of smart meters means that there's millions of additional access points uh, into the smart grid. And uh, what this effectively means is the smart grid is the largest attack surface after the internet itself. So when you give that some thought, it really is, as Anne said, there's no borders to this. It is the largest attack surface after the internet itself. Uh, monitors and sensors, which are required to provide the intelligence in the smart grid. Monitors and sensors feed back information to control systems. Very easy to uh, hop on those signals, potentially uh, create cascading effects, as we saw in the 2003 blackout. And we all, for those of us that were lived through that, and I know Paul, you certainly, <laughs> certainly did. Uh, we have firmly, firmly convinced ourselves that we cannot live without electricity. So, uh, the the real risk with cybersecurity, as with the smart grid, is these cascading effects that can cause a significant downtime. Uh, physically unsecured entry points. The utility industry is very different than most industries. Most points of presence in the industry in this industry are unmanned. Uh, without, without building enclosures, so they don't have the typical, if you like, human security that would be present within most businesses. So that obviously represents another risk to the entire uh, grid. And third party interconnections. So by definition, the smart grid is interconnected and grid neighbors such as transmission entities, uh, generation entities, uh, vendors, and increasingly, all the microfit renewables that are out there are now new access points into the internet. And once again, all this creates an exponentially increasing attack surface. Uh, so this makes for a very complex problem. This is, in fact, a national security issue. We were just talking prior to this panel about the need for Canada as a country to really get on top of this. Uh, right now, all direction, all legislation is being driven from the US. There's some good stuff happening. We're a part of it but uh, that's being cascaded and downloaded to Canada. So we really have to, as Canadians, get on top of this. And as identified in the Ontario Smart Grid Forum, defense in depth is the way to mitigate and manage your uh, security risks. So let me talk about defense in depth. First off, who endorses defense in depth? Really, it's the, the good think tanks uh, in the United States, as the United States Department of Energy has made defense in depth mandatory for any smart grid recipient. And this is the $4.5 billion stimulus funding that was announced last year. So to gain access to that funding, the utilities have to prove a defense in depth security posture. 
Uh, FERC, which is the U.S. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has integrated defense in depth into all its policies and procedures. And the relevance for Canada is that FERC is the one who empowers NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, and NERC has jurisdiction in Canada. So you can see how U.S. policy drives right into Canada. And NERC, through its critical infrastructure protection standards, the SIP standards, has uh, endorsed a defense in depth approach. And finally, the NIST committees and the committees that Daniel and, and our company are on really are all about a defense in depth posture. So what is defense in depth? Uh, I like to uh, use this visual to describe it. It's uh, helpful to think of it from a military perspective of having layers of defense. Uh, first off, you do need perimeter protection. Uh, from a security control perspective, this would be firewalls, DMZs, VPNs, uh, etc. But as Daniel very appropriately said, this in itself is not effective security. Stuxnet and the new malwares that are attacking the utility industry go through firewalls. Stuxnet was propagated by USB ports and then hopped onto control signal protocols and thus flowed through firewalls. Interior security. This is where we do a lot of work uh, in Canada and the United States to educate and to build uh, solutions for utilities to provide interior security. We think this is really the, the, uh, the important element. This is where you're compartmentalizing and segregating your systems. For example, you do want to sec segregate your AMI system from control systems such as SCADA and distribution automation. If you don't have those segregated, then you run the risk of having crossover effects between your smart meter systems and your control system functions. Monitoring, very key. Very few utilities today are monitoring the health of their environment from a cybersecurity perspective. So this is something that's very critical to be able to, if, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, and, and that's really what the basis for monitoring cybersecurity is all about. Management means that you need to have reporting, you need to be reporting on the health of your uh, systems, and you need to build this into your governance processes uh, as well as operational plans. Uh, process, we always stress that uh, cybersecurity is a process, it's not a technology. It is not a firewall. It is much more than that. So for the engineers in the crowd and for the process folks in the crowd, you'll be able to align this very nicely of thinking about it as a process. Now, I want to loop back to Anne's privacy discussion to say this defense in depth approach absolutely uh, supports the uh, uh, privacy uh, by design model in the end-to-end -end security full life cycle, uh, number five segment, I believe. So uh, we're actually doing some work here in Ontario with a group of uh, large Ontario utilities who say, I really want to ensure that my AMI implementations are secure, and oh, by the way, make sure that we're looking at privacy as well. So that's something that I think is very progressive that's being done here in Ontario. So uh, with that, I will... Um, pass it over to Paul. Maybe one thing I'd like to say though is uh, sometimes when we talk about this and we throw around all the acronyms and the technology people say well this really sounds pretty complicated and how do you even start? Uh, I will say to you that we are every day helping utilities small to large building effective defense and depth programs. This does not have to be billions of dollars. It can be done very effectively. And to Anne's point about privacy is this is significant cost avoidance, operational avoidance. For any of you that have had laptops uh, compromised, and we all probably all have, think about that in a utility environment where your control system or your smart meter network gets compromised and you've got man months, perhaps man years to recover. So that's something you absolutely want to avoid. So with that, I'll pass it back to Paul. Thanks very much, Doug, and thanks to all the panel for, uh, for managing to fit within the time frame as well. But we've got a few minutes for some questions. Um, I mean, we've heard uh, Ann talk about the importance of, of building privacy in from the outset. Uh, John's talked about the policy framework that's been put in place to ensure that privacy, security, other principles actually get applied consistently within, uh, within our sector here. Uh, Daniel's talked about the security challenges, some of the uni unique challenges that, that, that there are, and some of the threats, and Doug's talked about the, uh, the, the risks and the need to, uh, to pursue a defense in depth approach. Um, and every one of those topics could, we could delve into uh, much, much deeper, but uh, please w walk up to the microphone if you have any questions, but maybe, maybe to start things off, I'll, I'll, I'll start with one while, you, while you're thinking of, of one. Um, 
can we really build in this, the, uh, the security in the way of, uh, of segregating systems or whatever we have to do to do that? And can we really design in the privacy uh, that you talk about, Anne, without, without sort of making the products or services that we're trying to provide um, too expensive or non-competitive or just you know, too encumbered with these other things that they can't be managed? to use the microphone. Thank you. We, we must, uh, we can and we must. Uh, f from the privacy perspective, we always say that if you embed the privacy protections from the outset, the, the cost is relatively low, especially if you're embedding it at the creation of an emerging system. With respect to privacy, it's when energy usage data touches personally identifiable data, either directly or through some data linkage. Those are the only times you have to concern yourself with privacy. And what do I mean by privacy? If you need a shorthand for privacy, think use. How is the data used? So when we worked with Hydro One and Toronto Hydro, for example, we identified the areas where identifiable data was used for purposes of you know, d delivering the energy to the household, billing the service, things of that nature. There's a finite number of uses. That's when you must have access to the identifiable data. It's completely permitted, and we encourage the use of that data for those purposes. But that's it. That's called the primary purpose, end of story. It's additional secondary uses of data for unauthorized secondary purposes by third parties unknown to the data subject to the customer. That's where the concerns arise. And when I was in I was talking at the Smart Grid Alliance in Washington last year, and there was a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz in the audience about the monetization of the data flows that were, that were going to arise from the Smart Grid. That's when you know my back goes up, I go crazy. Because it's not that I'm against monetization of the data flows, as long as it is with the consent of the customer. You don't monetize data flows that are identifiable without the customer's consent and involvement. So we identified what is the data used for that's personally identifiable, restrict the usage to that purpose, which the customer knows about. If you want to use it for additional secondary uses, different purposes, great, ask the customer. With the customer's consent, do whatever you want with the data. That's how we linked it. And it's eminently doable right at the beginning, especially. You can also do it once the system is in place. We've got a, an extension of privacy by design called privacy by redesign about existing mature legacy systems. But I assure you, this is eminently doable, and we'll walk you through how to do it. Great. It's possible, and it's already starting to be done. So. Um of course, it's just going to be, there's just going to be a need to continually innovate. And one thing that I have faith in is innovation. Um, I believe if you get a bunch of very smart, uh, you know, people together and you create uh, the necessary market incentives uh, in order to continue innovation, you're going to always have, you know, uh, better solutions than what you can possibly imagine today. And the only other, you know, parallel example that I would give is uh, in terms of people saying, oh, you know, it doesn't make economic sense to do this or, um, you know, it can't be done. How many people here would actually use the internet if they had that attitude of not, you know, building in security uh, along the, you know, everyday uh, web services we rely on, like our web banking and and all of the things that we do online? Um, if they didn't start to build in security, would you guys be users of the internet? Would we be having like fantastic, uh, you know, IPO successes around a lot of these companies and the new industries they've generated? Of course not. It's the same here. It's a, it's a necessary reality. Just like to add to that, I was actually in the telecom industry when we first unrolled the internet in Canada and we missed the mark totally on security and the cost and the rework was just absolutely unbelievable. And there's been recent work done related to the utility industry that says doing cybersecurity after the fact is actually three to five times more expensive. So we, we absolutely align to what Ann says, that this is foundational stuff. It's not cost burdening uh, and it should be done right from the design. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I would just add, it's it's really, the approach that's getting taken in terms of a policy framework is really, it's just a cost of doing business. And since we're on the cusp of kind of a new paradigm of operation for the electricity grid, as we're starting to collect that information, we need to be thinking about privacy up front. So part of it is a process thing. It's, it's actually doing privacy impact assessments proactively, so you have an idea of which information is sensitive, which isn't, and what plan you're going to have in place. And then if information is sensitive, 
then you're looking at, okay, well, what controls need to be in place? And, that, and those costs will really be weighed against the, by the regulator against the benefits of that, that uh, proposal to do that addition to the grid. It's, it's not really a question of whether the privacy or security additions themselves are uh, cost effective. Yes, question? Um, Please. So you said that there were many access nodes or access points on the grid, right? A smart grid. Um, let's take, for example, uh, the sensors and um, in the sense that you have smart meters for microfit and, um, you know, fit program. So are you guys working on a universal solution uh, in terms of security and privacy? Well, there's certainly, there's, and there is no universal solution. Um, so companies like, like mine help utilities and renewables who are connecting to the grid understand their risks. Uh, one of the challenges has been lack of consistent standards. And the work that we've done with Daniel and the NIST work was, was an effort to, to bring together some harmonized standards, but they, they, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so it really is, uh, and each utility or each smart grid deployment is just a little different too. So everybody has different uh, technologies in place. They may be wireless technologies, they may be wireline technologies, they may be uh, control functions. It really depends on what the uh, uh, smart grid deployment is doing. So you need to look at it. You need to look at it from a threat risk perspective. You need to understand the risks that are potential. And then what you do is you knock off the highest probability risks. You will never ever have 100% security so the name of the game here is all about hitting off the, the high probability, high impact items. If I, could, if I could just add one thing on the privacy side. Just last year, uh, Privacy by Design was voted in unanimously at the international level as the international privacy standard that everyone is following worldwide. So as a global standard, you can point to Privacy by Design. And if you go to our website, you'll see how it operates in, in various ways. Oh, please go ahead. Hi, there. my name is Zell Artan, and I'm very pleased to be in front of you, Dr. Kavorkin. It's an honor. I've been studying a lot of things with cybersecurity for a number of years now. I'm uh, listed on the Department of Homeland Security, cybersecurity researchers, people, and it's for me, it's critical street, it's critical key stroke infrastructures. And I put the analogy down what if the ice cream factory's plugs were pulled out? You'd have a lot of melted goo everywhere and uh, you know with respect to know your customer compliance and having access portals for information when you have so many uh, uh, employees and organizations all around the world accessing information is one point but when you look at someone uh, an organization like US CERT or Einstein and it's the early warning defense system for the world for Microsoft and everyone else why aren't we looking at reverse engineering technologies like that to be able to put that intuitively into these systems that are being built for smart gridding to ensure that uh, the monitoring is there and the compliance is there through uh, through these uh, you, you know Department of Homeland Security uh, mandates I can talk a little to that because I yeah I can talk a little to that uh, because I've actually been working with uh, US CERT and more specifically under DHS an organization known as ICS CERT uh, and ICS CERT is industrial control systems. It's kind of like a US CERT for industrial control systems. And in fact, it already exists. I've already helped them write um, some advisories. Uh, it's just that those advisories typically, um, you know, do not get necessarily public circulation. They don't get public circulation because these are critical systems. And if I'm putting out vulnerability information, I'm actually, you know, it, it's a very delicate balance in terms of kind of controlling who's going to get that and what they can do actionable with it. But is, it is that not counterintuitive to being able to collaborate to protect? Uh... It's, a, it's an excellent point, and that's why I think if you also look at, uh, you know, what the White House is saying uh, with their latest legislative agenda, they emphasize much more information sharing. Um, the reality is that with these advisory groups, by the time you're um, advertising a lot of this stuff, it's not real time, and um, depending on the vulnerability that you're dealing with, uh, you know, you're, you could be putting out an advisory while the lights are going out, so it's not very effective. And so um, what needs to happen there, and I'll be in another conference uh, in October in the, in the 
in San Diego. Um, I actually recommend people go look it up. It's called Smart Grid uh, Security West. And I will be on a panel with the Department of uh, Homeland Security, Department of Energy, and some other vendors that are coming on board. And we'll be actually talking through the idea of building uh, a network of security operation centers. And if there is an actual, um, you know, an actual cyber event, how do you detect it? How do you coordinate? And how do you begin to do things on a, on a real-time basis? Uh, because the reality is that early warning system, uh, in a technical sense, is not there. And then there's a lot of other issues. Uh, private industry is very nervous about you know, government getting their hands on critical infrastructure and telling them what to do because they don't necessarily understand how to operate it. And that could actually be a bigger security and reliability res risk than anything else. Yeah, it's uh, just to pl I'm not gonna plug the name or num name of the personal organization right now, but a friend of mine is a physicist, software engineer that's been reprogramming the Los Alamos nuclear testing facilities to take out redundancies within the silos to be able for them to communicate with each other. He's been doing that for four and a half years now. And if he can apply his core technology to having these systems that have never been communicating to communicate um, to function, perhaps there is, you know, some sort of, some genius out there that has the, the answers, um, perhaps, along with, I mean, I'm a big advocate for biometrics. Perhaps there is a key to this, along with uh, Dr. Corgan's uh, research in solving this real time uh, from someone that's a caveman sitting somewhere coding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks very much for your question. Um, I think that's going to have to uh, wrap it up. Um, I, I mean, I, I, with this with this panel, you know, what's really unique? I mean, we've got we've got panelists up here from uh, from you know the perspectives of government policy, from regulation, from the industry folks that are actually engaged very deeply in this. And the nice thing about it is that we don't have to go elsewhere in the world for the experts. The experts are here, and they're here in Ontario, and they're here in front of you. And I'd really like to thank the panel for their contributions today. I'll, uh, I'll echo that remark, Paul, thank you, and thanks to the panel. I have a small token of our appreciation here. Um, what's interesting, in every one of these panels, the same thing happens every time. We just get warmed up, right, and then it's over. Um, thanks to also to the audience. Thank you for your questions and your participation. Starting uh, in this theater in, like I was, it says on my sheet, 15 minutes. In about two minutes is demo camp, and I encourage you to, to look in on what that particular event is about. And uh, thank you all again, and I'm going to say thank you to each of the panel members now, and thanks for your time. Thank you.